Welcome to this panel. It is legal representation as a tool for justice. Why? legal representation matters. And I know each and every, every one of you knows why it matters, but we're gonna talk with this group of expert panelists that have years and years of, of experience in thinking about providing, designing, talking about immigration legal services. So to start, I wanna welcome our audience members virtually. Hello, welcome our audience members in person. Um, I want to thank the panelists this morning and this afternoon who set um, who set the stage for us to talk. I was moved in so many ways by so many things that they said. One of the things that came through powerfully and clearly is that we can do this, folks. We can do this through a, for the lens of hope and creativity. Um, and they set the stage for us to talk why immigration legal services is an integral part of any frontline solutions to ensure the dignity of migrants and an effective and able immigration system. So with that, I'm going to introduce you quickly to our panelists, ask them a couple questions, and they'll they, I get them to talk a bit about their experience, and then we'll take questions. Uh, and I'm mindful of time, and I'm gonna keep track of the time, and both Doris and Andy in the front are ready to give me this. So thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so, I'm the moderator. I'm the executive director of Catholic Legal Immigration Services. I talked with all of you this morning. Um, I also have on my right, Rodrigo Camarena, the director of Justicia Lab, and formerly, I think it's Pro Bono Immigrant Advocates Network. And you'll explain, Rodrigo. Um, Annie Chen, the initiative director of Advancing Universal Representation with the Vera Institute. To my right, Emmett Soper, who is counsel to the director, Executive Office for Immigration Review, U.S. Department of Justice. So he is counsel to David Neer, Neil. Um, I also want to add that he was an immigration judge. I appeared before him. It was a pleasure to appear before him. He got me in and out in 10 minutes during a master calendar. Thank you, Judge Soper. Uh, and also on my left, last and certainly not least, old friend and colleague, Wendy Young, who is the president of Kids in Need of Defense Kind, who we all know. So thank you all for being here. So run of show, we're going to start with Emmett. After we're gonna to talk to Rodrigo about IT and innovative solutions, uh, Annie's then gonna share all her experience and knowledge and richness about universal representation um, and the work that Vera has been doing for years. And we're gonna wrap up with Wendy, who's gonna talk about how she's leveraged thousands and thousands of pro bono hours and attorneys to represent kids. So with that, we're gonna start with Emmett. Emmett, if you could just tell us a wee bit about what you do um, for uh, EOIR and, and for David Neal, um, and then share with us a little bit about EOIR, sure. Executive Office for Immigration Review, folks, in case you don't know the acronym. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Emmett Soper, and is uh, I'm counsel to the director of uh, the Executive Office for Immigration Review. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to to be here today. My permanent position, as was mentioned, is as an immigration judge at the. Uh, um, what's now the Annandale Virginia Immigration Court, currently work for uh, David Neal, the director of EOIR as his counsel. Um, a few things that I want to cover in my presentation today, and here is generally where I plan to go. I want to talk a little bit about, in general terms, representation in EOIR proceedings and why it is so important. Uh, having done that, uh, I'll go on to talk a bit about uh, some particular EOIR initiatives and programs that we have to encourage representation in the immigration courts. Uh, well, with respect to representation in general, I'm sure most people here know, the Executive Office for Immigration Review conducts removal proceedings involving non-citizens who are charged as subject to removal. Uh, we conduct uh, certain other types of uh, legal proceedings as well um, involving non-citizens. In removal proceedings before the immigration court, non-citizens can argue that they are not, in fact, uh, subject to removal. They can also apply for various forms of immigration relief, um, the most obvious example of which would probably be asylum. Uh, non-citizens in removal proceedings uh, before the courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals are entitled to be represented, but at no expense to the government. Um, I want to 
go right now into a few statistics about representation before EOIR. These statistics are available on EOIR's website, the ones I'm going to highlight, as well as some others relating to this general topic. The overall representation rate in immigration court cases is 43%. Um, the thing to remember about the statistic is that generally when non-citizens are put into immigration court proceedings, uh, they are unrepresented at the beginning of their case. Those that acquire counsel do so at some point down the road after they have been put into proceedings. The 43% figure includes all cases before the immigration court, including those that have just started and in which no hearing has yet been held. If you look at cases that are further along in the process, for example, those where an application for immigration relief has actually been filed, the picture as far as representation does get a little bit better. Uh, for example, cases, cases that are pending before the immigration court where the non-citizen has filed an asylum application have a roughly 75% representation rate. Uh, cases completed by the immigration court that involved an asylum application have a uh, roughly 86% uh, representation rate at the time of completion. And uh, cases completed by the Board of Immigration Appeals that involved an asylum application have a roughly 86% completion rate um, at the, comp I'm sorry, uh, representation rate at the completion of the appeal. Uh, generally speaking, EOIR would, would love to see all non-citizens in removal proceedings represented. Uh, and I can say that both as a matter of fairness and as a matter of efficiency as well. Uh, where somebody in proceedings is represented, I think that the system benefits. And this applies not just where the person in proceedings has a, a strong claim to, uh, to immigration relief, but also in other cases as well. So I just said that the system benefits when a person is represented, and I want to unpack that a little bit and explain what I mean. Um, having representation in general terms helps a non-citizen to navigate the immigration courts. Where somebody is in immigration court proceedings and they're represented, their attorney or representative can um, talk to them outside of court, uh, determine what legal arguments they can plausibly make, as well as what immigration relief they uh, may potentially be eligible for and should apply for. Once potential relief is identified, the attorney or representative can fill out an application, can let the non-citizen know what evidence um, should be presented, can sometimes assist the non-citizen in gathering such evidence, and they can also prepare the non-citizen to testify in court at their hearing. When you get to the individual calendar hearing in a case, which is uh, the evidentiary hearing, where the non-citizen is represented, their attorney or representative generally conducts a direct examination of the non-citizen. And in doing so, the attorney or representative being familiar with the case knows the relevant facts to elicit during testimony and also knows what is not particularly relevant, what does not need to be testified to in court. And so the bottom line is that where a non-citizen is represented, you know, speaking generally, they have a greater ability to speak meaningfully in court because the attorney or representative can sort of package their case, can present the important evidence to the immigration judge, uh, can focus the non-citizen in their testimony on what's relevant, and can also draw out particular testimony that the um, immigration judge needs to consider. Uh, generally speaking, where a non-citizen is represented, cases proceed more efficiently, the record is cleaner, and regardless of whether the immigration judge ultimately decides to grant or deny the application, uh, they can likely do so with more confidence that they know all of the relevant facts and legal considerations. So those are some general thoughts about representation in general. The question is, how do we encourage representation before EOIR and increase representation rates? Um, as an agency, we administer a range of programs and initiatives that are designed to increase access to representation. Uh, generally speaking, these programs are run within EOIR by our um, Office of Legal Access Programs. And I'm sure many people in this audience are familiar with, with that uh, office. Uh, it performs a range of vital functions for EOIR, generally with the aim of ensuring that as many people in, as possible in EOIR proceedings um, have access to legal representation or other assistance. 
So I want to talk now about some of our main initiatives to increase representation. And I'll start by highlighting um, accredited representatives. EOR has a program that, again, I'm sure many people here are familiar with, um, under which uh, non-attorneys who meet certain requirements can be accredited to represent people in immigration court and before the Board of Immigration Appeals. Uh, this is known as the Recognition and Accreditation Program, and it's administered by EOIR's um, Office of Legal Access Programs. So there are two components to this program. The first relates to the recognition of nonprofit organizations, and the second to the accreditation of individuals who work for or uh, volunteer at one of those organizations. With respect to the first component, nonprofit organizations can apply with EOIR for recognition. Uh, the organization has to meet certain requirements that are set out by regulation. And um, one of those requirements is that the organization primarily serve low income or indigent clients. With respect to the second component, an organization that is uh, recognized by EOIR can apply for the accreditation of non-attorneys who work for or volunteer at the organization. There are two types of accreditation. The first is known as partial accreditation, which means that somebody can practice uh, before U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, or USCIS. The second known is known as full accreditation, which means that the person can practice before both USCIS and EOIR. Uh, fully accredited representatives are required to have immigration training, which has to be documented in the application that their organization submits on their behalf. There are currently over 850 recognized organizations and over 2,300 accredited representatives. A uh, significant majority of the accredited representatives, the current ones, uh, are partially accredited as opposed to fully accredited, and so can practice before USCIS, but not before um, EOIR, in other words, the Immigration Courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals. I want to talk a little bit more at this point about fully accredited representatives. Uh, from EOIR's perspective, the work that fully accredited representatives do is very valuable. Um, where you have a fully accredited representative who appears in immigration court on behalf of a non-citizen, from the point of view of the immigration judge and the non-citizen, there should be no difference between that accredited representative and an attorney. The idea is that a fully accredited representative uh, will do everything that an attorney would do in terms of preparing a case, uh, filing applications, and appearing in court on behalf of their client. And I want to point out one thing here, which is that immigration law is uh, specialized, as people are aware. Um, with respect to attorneys, you know, there's no requirement that an attorney appearing in front of EOR have any particular training in immigration law. Most do, but there's no there's no requirement to that effect. Um, there is, however, such a requirement for fully accredited representatives. As I said, as a, a condition of accreditation, um, a person has to receive immigration training and it has to be documented in the application that their organization submits. So you can be sure that a fully accredited representative has immigration training, which is which can be of real importance given the specialized nature of immigration law. As I mentioned, most accredited representatives are partially as opposed to fully accredited. We need more fully accredited representatives. And as an agency, we would encourage uh, those affiliated with um, recognized organizations uh, to become fully accredited. I'll talk a little bit now, uh, shifting gears about pro bono representation. Uh, EOR does a lot of things. We try to do a lot of things to encourage and facilitate pro bono representation. I wanna highlight a couple of them. Uh, in November of 2021, the EOIR director issued a, a public memo, which is available on our website, that's entitled Encouraging and Facilitating Pro Bono Representation. Don't have time right now to go into the details about that memo, but I'll say that it's a comprehensive agency statement on pro bono representation, and I would encourage people to take a look at that if, if interested. We also post on our website lists of pro bono legal service providers for each uh, immigration court. These are distributed in court to non-citizens as well. And these are really uh, the agency's, one of our primary ways of connecting unrepresented non-citizens uh, with attorneys and representatives who might potentially help them for little or no money. 
the requirement to appear on the list uh, is set out by regulation. And the idea behind the list is that the providers on the list uh, should actively be providing pro bono representation. Our pro bono lists are not intended as a way for uh, other legal service providers to solicit for, for paying clients. Um, we also post on our website uh, specialized pro bono lists. We have a list of organizations that provide services for people on the dedicated docket, which is a specialized uh, immigration court docket uh, for certain families who are in proceedings. Uh, we have a list of organizations that provide remote services for people in immigration custody. And uh, some courts also have specialized pro bono lists uh, specifically for those courts' uh, juvenile dockets. With respect to the specialized lists, we're trying to be as precise as possible in, in terms of uh, matching non-citizens with organizations that might be in a position to offer them assistance in proceedings. Uh, we recognize the reality of capacity restraints. Uh, we're doing our best to build capacity through cooperation with pro bono legal service providers, uh, for example, through training of law students and pro bono attorneys, uh, and by trying to cooperate to increase the number of fully accredited representatives. Uh, we um, encourage legal service providers to contact EOIR with ideas for increasing capacity. We're always willing to listen and to discuss ideas that relate to ways to build pro bono capacity and to um, increase pro bono representation. Uh, we recognize that law school clinics as well often play an important role in providing pro bono services. And I'll just highlight that next week, EOIR is holding a national stakeholder meeting for faculty, staff, uh, and students from law school clinics. <clears throat> Three other EOR initiatives relating to uh, to representation, and I'll just run I'll, I'll run through them at this point. Our, our national qualified representation program, which is a long-standing one uh, pertaining to non-citizens who've uh, been found to lack mental competency. Uh, EOIR's Council for Children initiative, which is a, a newer program that's aimed at children in proceedings. And the Immigration Court Help Desks, which function in 24 non-detained immigration courts, uh, which is a fairly dramatic expansion and are intended to help people understand what to expect when they come to immigration court. These are important initiatives, um, and I'm happy to discuss them more a little bit further on when we take questions. I'll just close at this point by saying that we at EOIR recognize the importance of representation in proceedings. There's always room for improvement, obviously, and to that end, we welcome ideas from stakeholders that uh, pertain to representation. Those are my prepared remarks for right now. Again, a bit later on, happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Emmett. And thank you also to the Office to EOIR and Director Neal for your openness in collaborating and working with the, with the uh, lawyers, accredited reps, and then the legal service field. I would just note that... Um, Clinic supports and the backbone of our organization are accredited representatives, uh, non-lawyers, which is pretty shocking for many lawyers. Uh, I, mean, I fully and 100% advocate for them because there are not enough lawyers. Um, and additionally, um, they are an important backbone for us, but also they live in the communities they serve and they stay in those communities. So they know the people in their communities. And as um, um, counsel, uh, as Emmett said, um, they're trained, they're required to be trained before they go to court or before they go to USCIS. So they are an important, important and vital, vital element in providing legal representation. So thank you so much, Emmett. So now we're going to turn to technology. We talked about the government and we talked about the courts and the programs. And now we're going to talk, we're going to turn to technology. And Rodrigo, um, um, I would just share with the whole audience, one of the last speakers reminded us, and this actually made me sit up a little bit straight, it startled me that this is the first time that real-time information is available to migrants on their journey, right? Us old timers remember when there weren't even, they couldn't even call you, right? And you had to go to pay for phone booths in certain countries for them to call you. Um, and this is real-time information. So pretty exciting and pretty challenging and full of opportunities. Your org organization, Rodrigo, has been advocating for greater use of technology to support immigrants and, and provide them access to immigration legal services in the face of some skepticism by NGOs. I remember the, 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 the days of those skepticisms. Mm -hmm. Of course, now you're, you're way ahead of your time. So if you could tell us a little bit how you started this work, why? Um, what benefits you see from these tools and also the challenges. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rodrigo Camarena. I'm the director of Justicia Lab. Um, how many of you know who we are? 
All right. Mm -hmm. I see a handful. Well, if you don't know who we are, it's because we used to be known as the Immigration Advocates Network, which is still a platform that we manage. How many of you are Ian members or have been to our Immigration Legal Services Directory? Immigration Law Hub that are great. <laughs> well, uh, how many of you use Citizenship Works, our digital tool to file? Okay, more hands. What about Immy.org? Okay, more hands. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much for the hands. <laughs> Um, so we built digital tools for immigrant justice. We are a non-for-profit uh, program of Pro Bono Net, which has been leading uh, this work in, in, in bridging access to justice and technology for uh, almost 25 years. And you know, our work really comes from that assumption that there's not enough lawyers and there's really never going to be enough lawyers unless we have some uh, serious structural reforms in this country. Um, and so our tools really try to bridge that gap for advocates, so both non-lawyer advocates like myself, um, accredited reps, uh, paralegals, anyone working with immigrants. Many of our tools provide guardrails for folks to be able to have conversations, structured conversations with migrants to file uh, pro se, for instance, or on their own. Uh, all of our tools use plain language because, you know, it's hard enough to get information in, in non-English languages, but the, even when it's in English, it's really convoluted and, uh, you know, includes Latin and all these uh, <laughs> things that we can't really uh, decipher. So I think um, our work is, is solely focused on how do we take this convoluted system and simplify it for immigrants and their advocates by using technology? Um, and so while we have been working very hard to uh, connect the dots, we also understand that uh, you know, we're in this era right now where uh, technology is changing very quickly. The availability of information has never been so so uh, so uh, accessible, and uh, we're both living in a in sort of a, a really exciting time, but also a very scary time, right? Uh, with misinformation and AI now being able to generate thousands of tweets and you know millions of. Uh, 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 it's a poor information. We need to really step up our game as technologists, but also as advocates to make sure that we get the best information out there to to, to the people that we're trying to help. Um, so we've been working in this space for some time, over 15 years. We, we just rebranded as Hussisi Lab. Um, and I think for us, it's really about, you know, leveling the playing field so that as a migrant, you can understand your case, you can understand what you're eligible for and what you're not in real time and in your own language. And as an advocate, even if you're not a lawyer like me, <laughs> you can advocate for someone, you can support them through a process with confidence and knowing that you're not gonna uh, you know, fall in um, violation of an authorized practice of law. So uh, you know, it's really exciting to work with um, many partners here to connect the dots, uh, but ultimately, you know, we function on the on the understanding that the system is unjust. It's built for injustice, and while we're fixing some of that injustice by making you know information and resources more accessible, we really need to uproot the system that we're living in and that we're putting people through because it's it's inherently unfair and inherently violent. So. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Those are my remarks. And Rick, can you tell, you shared some talking points with me on specific um, projects you're working on and, and groups you're working on. Can you tell us a little bit more who you're assisting and how? Sure. So we have hundreds of nonprofit partners that use our tools. At the moment, we're working with um, a number of partners in the Houston area to develop a universal intake tool. I know it's been something that people have talked about for some time, but you know, we we think that there shouldn't be a world where, as a migrant, you tell your story to someone repeatedly, right? You relive that trauma. You go office to office telling someone your story, and none of that gets captured. None of that gets uh, honored or shared with the person that can help you. And so we're developing uh, technology that is safe, can be accessible from a mobile phone, um, and lets someone, you know, be able to communicate with a machine um in a way that doesn't expose their identity and identify if they're eligible for a form of relief this is based on our emmy interview which some of you might use and know and the idea is that once you're put through that process you can then say hey i want to get legal services um and then connect with a with an authorized uh, representative um but you know it doesn't make sense for us to connect people to legal assistance in areas that are saturated with demand, right? We did a study with the Center for Migration Studies a few years ago where we found there are 1,400 uh, migrants in need of help for every 
one legal representative. That's on average, right? Um, but in you know Dallas Fort Worth, that number is, goes up to four thousand migrants for every one legal representative. And in New York, where I am, that number is eight hundred. So um, wouldn't it be great if we can collect someone in Dallas to a lawyer in Brooklyn, New York, where I am, uh, to support their case and, and support uh, you know access to justice in a more meaningful way? So those are some of the things we're working on, along with trying to connect, trying to make AI really work for us, right? There's a lot of scary uh, examples of how AI is changing this field and, and, and maybe making the world worse. But we think uh, that done right, we can capture and harness this energy and do a lot of uh, good. Yeah. Thank you, Rodrigo. And then just, I was just thinking, um, you know, when you're identifying needs, I always think about wouldn't it be great if we could have mobile trailers or RVs and us old timers when we retire, take three months a year and go around to the immigration deserts and do know your rights and councils and help fill out forms. So I'm just putting a plug for that, folks. If we want to organize it, let's, let, you know, let's talk. Um, so thank you, Rodrigo. And thank you for, um, during our preparations, making us all brave about IT and AI. And I think we have to leave the old law office model that we, uh, many of us in this room, not all, thankfully, we have a lot of great young energy um, had where people came in between nine to five to the offices and we filled in forms. This is a new day, a new age. And I would, you know, I really encourage and believe in using all the tools necessary in IT. Um, and so thank you so much, Rodrigo, for leading it in light of skepticism initially and it was lovely to meet you five years ago and hear you talking about it so thank you thank you very much um so now we're going to move over to annie chen who is um who it works with vera and has been leading the charge on universal representation i remember when i first heard that i thought that will never happen well however folks i believe it will and it was great to hear this morning for example um, you know, I walked away from this morning's panel actually thinking we can do this again, right? Think about the times when we were fighting for driver's licenses, uh, in-state tuition. Everybody said it's impossible. It won't. It can't be done. And how many states now have those? So I just want to thank Annie for being here with us. And I want to thank Vina, Vera for taking the lead. So Annie, um, we're we're moving over to you. So so please talk to us and, and tell us how you've been working to support immigration legal service providers and advanced universal representation. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Anna. Yes. So yeah, I, I do. I lead Vera's Advancing Universal Representation Initiative. Um, I come to this work as an attorney who has represented immigrants. That's what I did before I went to Vera. For the last 10 years, um, I've been at Vera trying to advance legal representation or one way, one way or the other. And, <clears throat> you know, I'll just say a little bit more about Vera. You know, we started in New York in 1961. Now it's a national org uh, with offices in four cities. And broadly at Vera, what we do is we pilot solutions and we use research to evaluate the impact. And then when we find that solutions work, we scale them through advocacy and we try to scale them nationally. And our goal is to transform the criminal, legal, and immigration system so that they're more fair and accountable to all. So definitely really appreciate, Rodrigo, what you're talking about. Like, we're fighting for legal representation. That is our goal, federally funded, you know, right to legal representation for all immigrants who are facing deportation. But recognizing that this is one, you know, critical step that needs to happen among a lot of other systemic reforms. And we've got, you know, detention as a major problem. We've got the connection between the criminal legal system and the immigration system system that criminalizes immigrants. And we're working in that broader context and really recognizing that, you know, um, universal representation is part of that solution. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit about some of the progress that we've made. This is definitely not like a Vera only movement. This has grown so much. Um, partners at this table all around the country have grown this movement in the last 10 years. So um, let's see. Um, you've heard about um, the need for representation. There are about 1.3 million people right now who don't have counsel um, in the immigration courts. And we know that representation makes a huge impact. Just a few stats that we, we I think folks know that generally, if you are providing representation, you have 10 times more likely, you're 10 times more likely to obtain relief from deportation than if you don't have representation. And um, three and a half more times likely to be granted bond. 
<clears throat> so we're not we're talking about release from detention, somebody's liberty, as well as their ability to remain permanently in the United States. And also much brought much beyond the individual's case, we're talking about impact in the community and broader impact on the entire immigration system. So you know, one of the things that we do is we set up deportation defense programs in partnership with government legal services providers and community advocates. So we launched um, the Safety and Fairness for Everyone Network. That's a national network in partnership with 25 jurisdictions around the country at the local and state level. It launched in 2017, and all of those jurisdictions are part of this larger movement of now uh, 60 jurisdictions at the local and state level who are funding deportation defense and setting up um, you know, these projects. Um, and so that is a really important um, I think that progress at the local and level, which is also working in partnership with with advocates, with communities to meet urgent needs in communities, as well as building this broader infrastructure, um, is just so key to this um, to this goal of advancing universal representation. We've also partnered with um, you know EOIR and some of the access to counsel programs, and currently um, with um, ORR and the Acacia Justice Center and orgs like Kind to um, on providing counsel to unaccompanied children. And Vera, we do a lot of advocacy. We have a federal campaign uh, where we introduced uh, legislation earlier this year, a marker bill in the House and in the Senate called the Fairness to Freedom Act. Our, uh, we partner with the National Partnership for New Americans on this campaign. And you know, there the goal there is to really establish uh, what we see as the North Star in this in the representation movement of establishing a federal defender system. Um, federally funded right to counsel that would provide uh, representation for everybody facing deportation. And um, there, that is a coalition of over 200 organizations that are part of this campaign, which we're really excited about. And we also have key uh, state campaigns um, that are advancing not only state funded representation programs, but right to counsel at the state level as well. And there's legislation that has been pending on that in Maryland and also New York, um, which made um, good progress on that in the in the past year. Um, I On the sort of the point about local and state progress, I definitely just wanna shout out some of the really innovative work that's being done by legal services organizations, community organizations, local and state government all around the country. Um, there have been really innovative programs in the state of Oregon, for example. New York has definitely uh, been a leader in this issue. Chicago, there's the Midwest Immigrant Defenders Alliance um, that's setting up a program in the Chicago Immigration Court focused on everyone in detention. And a lot of these programs, they started off focusing on um, people in that the jurisdiction, the limited uh, geographic jurisdiction, but some of the innovations now are really about serving people once they are transferred, because uh, we all know that, you know, um, immigration detention is a national system. People can be transferred from one part of the country to another part of the system um, at any time. And so continuing that representation once it's been initiated so people aren't transferred um, away from legal counsel is something that is being that is being addressed right now um, in practice and in coordination um, through the provision of legal services as well as through legislation that's been ha that's happening at the state level and also through the Fairness to Freedom Act um, at the federal level. So I think that's, I could go on, but I maybe I'll just stop there for a second to, and happy to answer more questions. Okay. And Annie, I think I have, you know, I have a couple questions and there's mm -hmm. questions coming in, but what we'll do is mm -hmm. we'll, we'll ask, we'll go to our colleague, Wendy, um, and ask Wendy to talk to us a little bit about how the work that KIND has been doing and grew from a small office that I recall <laughs> to a very large organization um, and how you're expanding immigration legal services. And then I have questions coming in virtually 
and then we'll we'll queue up and then we'll answer questions. How's that? Great. Thank Great. you, Anna. And I have to say, I'll go glamping with you anytime in my retirement to deliver <laughs> immigration legal services, but emphasis on glamping, not camping. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, let me say thank you to Clinic, uh, to MPI and to Georgetown for hosting this annual conference, which really has become a terrific convening event every year. Um, so KIND, Kids in Need of Defense, was uh, founded uh, through a partnership uh, um, between Microsoft Corporation and Angelina Jolie in her capacity as then UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador to close a very critical, a critical legal services gap in the immigration system, which is the representation of unaccompanied children in deportation proceedings before the immigration courts and before USCIS. We heard a lot of discussion around the lack of representation in the system overall. And this was also true of children at the time. Uh, this was around 2008, where uh, we would see children as, as young as babies and toddlers in immigration court expected mm -hmm. to raise a defense against deportation, standing there without a lawyer by their side. So KIND was grounded in the, the idea that the private sector could be a critical resource to bring to the table to deploy, to provide representation to these very vulnerable children. And of course, the challenge now is even more complex than it was when we began our work in 2009, because the number of unaccompanied children, as I'm sure you're aware, has grown dramatically starting back in 2014. So at this point, we're regularly seeing more than 100,000 children arrive alone at our borders each year in search of protection in the United States and placed into deportation proceedings. And of course, the immigration system itself has become more complex over time and more restrictive. So, but bottom line, I'm going to start by saying the North Star remains for us that justice cannot be achieved and systems cannot be truly functional until legal representation is provided to individuals in deportation proceedings, including children. So why are we turning to the private sector for support? Well, certainly the private sector is not the only solution, but it can be an integral part of the problem solving as we look at the issue of the lack of representation. And to quote one former head of the Legal Services Corporation, there is no way we can volunteer our way mm -hmm. out of the legal services crisis in this country. But certainly I, I continue to believe that the private sector is a critical factor in that problem solving. There is, in fact, a strong history of pro bono uh, in the United States. Um, and in fact, some now some state bars, such as in New York State, require a minimum of 50 hours of pro bono. So it's a, it's a tradition that we can tap into. You combine that with the fact that there are about 1.3 million lawyers in the United States, according to the ABA. And I'm struck by, Annie, your number, that there's 1.3 people without representation in the immigration system. If every lawyer took a case, maybe we could get there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but and I also want to say that I see a really growing interest among you young and new attorneys in providing pro bono representation in the immigration space. Mm -hmm. I think this is viewed as a very kind of key and and central part of the social justice crisis in this country. And there's a lot of eagerness to volunteer, which is quite heartening. Um, kind itself is celebrating our 15th anniversary uh, this year. Uh, hard to believe. Um, and we did start with seven staff, Anna. We're now up to about 520. So we've grown quite a bit. But um, during that time, we've generated 1. Si sorry, 1.75 million hours in private sector pro bono that's valued at over $750 million. So this is huge. And for every federal dollar invested in pro bono facilitation through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, we generate $7 in legal services. So there's a multiplier effect there for federal dollars that I think is, is key. Uh, interestingly, 50% of our pro bono attorneys actually come back to take a second or more case. I think there's a fundamental reason for this. Part of it is Kind's model, and I'll get back to that in a second, but part of it is because this speaks to the heart of most lawyers. They're actually helping a child who's in tremendous need. And I think most of us who are lawyers probably went to law school to make a difference in the world of justice. Um, and this is an opportunity to do so. The results are extraordinary. We win over 95% of our cases. This is over 15 years, including some administrations that I don't care to mention. <laughs> um, and without representation, only 13% of unaccompanied children win their cases. So this is truly life-saving work for very vulnerable children. Mm -hmm. The 
private sector is also important for another reason. Lawyers are obviously influential on the development of law and policy in this country. And by representing children, what we see is lawyers tuning in to this, this stark lack of justice in the immigration system. And they become very motivated to help us in our advocacy to push forward new initiatives to close the representation gap. So how do we do what we do? Um, first of all, it's very simplistic, but we recognize that our pro bono attorneys are volunteers. They do have day jobs. So we've designed a model that meets um, our volunteer lawyers halfway. We invest considerably in training and mentoring each lawyer. As we say, no question is too stupid or too small coming from our volunteers. And we assigned each of our lawyers, one of our expert staff attorneys who are expert in children's immigration law, to train and mentor our volunteer attorneys every step of the way through the representation experience. This is important for two reasons from our perspective. One, it results in quality representation of unaccompanied children in the courts. And secondly, it does inspire lawyers to come back for a second case because they feel supported throughout the process. Um, next, it's really important to invest in dialoguing with the leadership in major law firms and corporate legal departments. You need the buy-in at the top in order to generate the space for younger associates to take these cases on. Third, we've tried a lot of different and very innovative models along the way to make pro bono representation easier for our volunteers. This includes co-counseling with them at times. It includes encouraging them to create lawyer teams within their firms or companies, so it's not all falling on the shoulders of one volunteer, but they're teaming together, which many of the teams also appreciate from just a simple team building exercise within their, their place of employment. Um, and we also try to team experienced lawyers with more inexperienced lawyers so that there's kind of a ripple effect of expertise throughout our, the law firm or company. Um, Next, I'll say, and this is somewhat controversial, I reject the sense that pro bono attorneys can only take the quote unquote easy cases mm. or that sh they should be used for kind of ancillary functions around the case, such as intake clinics. I think both of those are very useful recruitment uh, tactics to bring more volunteer lawyers in. But I think we should challenge our pro bono attorneys. If we provide them with the training and mentoring, it doesn't matter if they're a corporate lawyer or a divorce lawyer or a real estate lawyer or any other kind of lawyer. Similar to what was said about um, BIA accredited reps earlier, if you provide them with the training, mm -hmm. they can do the work. Um, uh, Secondly, I think is again, to draw our partners into the overall movement, if you will, to try advance universal representation for individuals who are facing removal proceedings. They can be a very uh, credible and eloquent voice on our behalf. And basically what we're doing is challenging lawyers to be lawyers, to stand up for justice and do what's right in this country. So I'll end on a, a slightly more negative note. Um, <laughs> um, I think the main challenge for generating pro bono representation in this country right now is the dysfunctionality of the immigration system. We are increasingly hearing from our partners, wait a minute, you're telling me this case and Kine's um, uh, caseload will take an average of four and a half years. It could be more than that. That is a very big obligation for a private sector law firm or company to take on. So we need to work together to get that backlog straightened out so that we can get back on track and generate justice, which is what all of us in this room are about. Thanks. Thank you so much, Wendy. And it's definitely glamping. I've camped <laughs> once in my life. <laughs> and we won't talk about our age and no. how close retirement is. <laughs> and I just want to thank you. I want to thank you. I was moved and grateful. And I see it all the time, too, with my young attorneys um, to see how young attorneys are so excited and ready to volunteer and to get involved in pro bono matters. We need you and we are thankful. Um, also, I'd say Kind's model of training is vital. And I agree with you 100%. Mentoring and training, we're lawyers. The, the, the folks that are lawyers, we're lawyers. We, 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 three years in law school, Professor Andy Schoenholtz is here. He's going to come talk to us about this after. But they train us to do this work. So we can do it even if we are corporate lawyers. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm moved and I completely 100% agree with that. So I have a couple questions. I have a question. Um, I have a question first uh, for Emmett. 
um, about um, representation and staffing. And I would just before I, uh, we have Emmett speak to the staffing issue and the, the system, the immigration court system and the backlogs, I would just urge people to go on to the Center for Migration Studies website um, and they've published um, articles recently that talk about ways I mean, uh, they, uh, they talk about ways to support and change procedures, processes, et cetera, in the immigration court system to make it uh, make processes smoother, easier, more effective. And they're very supportive of it because the immigration courts have become the dumping ground for many of the problems in the immigration system. So, Emma, can you tell us a little bit about staffing and what EOIR is doing to, to increase staffing and lower these backlogs? Sure. Well, I mean, everybody's familiar with the backlog and it's, it's been going up and there are no easy answers to what we do about the backlog. With respect to staffing, we have been hiring a lot of people. Um, you know, th that is one way to to address the backlog issue. And we, we've been we, we've certainly been trying. We have at this point, I believe it's almost 700 immigration judges, which is a dramatic expansion from what it has been in the past. And we've all and it's not just a question of the number of judges, you need all kinds of um, uh, court staff to work with the judges to make the whole system function. You need law clerks to to assist the judges in, in making decisions. Judges are, are, are part of the equation, but they're not the whole picture. So we have almost 700 judges at that at this point. To give a bit of context, I started as an immigration judge in early 2017. And I believe at that point there were like 300 something immigration judges. So, you know, say what you want about, about, about the backlog. It is what it is. But EOIR has been doing a lot to ramp up hiring immigration judges and, and otherwise. Uh, we, we absolutely recognize how critical that is. Thank you. Emmett. And then, Annie, I have just a couple questions for you. Can you just, do, I mean, perhaps just simply define what universal representation means, mm -hmm. the definition of universal representation, so our folks here can talk about it after they leave and talk to their colleagues, friends, and family about why it's important? Sure. Um, and, and it's a good question because when people hear, uh, so what, what I mean when we Vera talks about universal representation, we're talking about um, a system where everybody facing deport, every immigrant facing deportation has you know, access to an attorney. So it is where we want to go, what we want to achieve. And there are a lot of steps before we're going to ultimately achieve, you know, that goal. Um, but, you know, when we talk about a universal representation approach or universal representation programs, we're talking about sometimes pilot programs that initially launch and you can't serve. Maybe there's you know, you can't serve everyone in a particular jurisdiction when you have, you're just starting a pilot project. Maybe you can serve a quarter of those folks. And so there's still an approach that you can take um, when you're implementing that initial program, that pilot, where you don't, um, you know, you don't, you take the case based on a first come first serve basis, for example, or you don't screen based on like eligibility. You don't only take the cases that might feel most winnable or most sympathetic because what we've seen is when that can, when that happens, um, when it's not like a blind approach to taking the case, sometimes our own biases can show up in different ways. And, um, certain types of cases are not picked like the ones that, <clears throat> involve, um, you know, intersection with the criminal legal system that are perceived to be harder um, for for whatever reason. And so, you know, we just think that because that it's really important in an approach and also in terms of the overall system that we ultimately want to build. And so the closest, the, the sort of broadest um, uh, approximation of that North Star right now uh, for us is the Fairness to Freedom Act, which is the marker legislation that was introduced um, in both houses of Congress earlier this year. And it is beyond even everybody who is in immigration court. It would cover, you know, people who are in expedited removal proceedings, um, but much broader than just uh, the scope of immigration court and 240 proceedings. Thank you, Annie. And just one follow-up question. How um, are universal representation programs funded in states? They can be funded. Uh, so I mentioned that there are uh, about 60 or so programs at the local and state level. All of those have 
at least some component that is publicly funded. So by the city council or by like a state budget item, you know, line item at city, state, county level. So there's like a, just however you would fund like a city or state budget, there's, um, that's, that's how it's funded. And then now what's happening, it can also oftentimes be started in collaboration with uh, private investment as well. And so you see a lot of these kinds of um, programs that have a number of different funding sources that are pulled together. And then as I mentioned earlier, what is really exciting and innovative that's happening at the state and local level now is the move for the right to actually be established at the local and state level. Mm -hmm. And that is really important too, to, um, you know, because it's an annual budget fight from the advocacy perspective. And so having the right there um, helps. And so that's that's the goal in a lot of places. And also why another reason why, you know, we have the federal legislative effort that um, we're advocating for. And, you know, we also I just want to make the point, too, I think that even with all of the amazing progress that's been happening at the local and state level, we all know that immigration, ultimately, it's a federal system. And so federal action on this is absolutely critical and also federal support. Think of what's happening at the local and state level is also really key. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, and then what, what we have 15 minutes and we're going to reserve those for questions. Um, first, I have a question from virtual. I'm going to take uh, one or two questions from our virtual folks. And then I'm mindful that we have a, a good number of folks, uh, folks in line. I'm very happy to see that. So um, the question is, what, what are some innovations that are coming from the philanthropic sector? Alternatively, what are some things that philanthropy needs to be doing differently to support migrants. So I'll share a little bit about a community college initiative, and then I'd ask folks to, to, to share um, information on they have. This is a state initiative, but we, our clinic is working with the state of California in what is called the Career Pathways Initiative. And it's a way to build capacity in the field because you, know, you have your emergency mode when we were at the border, we had to go down quickly. Um, and bring together resources as fast as possible to, to serve communities. Um, you know, you plan short term, medium, long term. So the Career Pathways Initiative is funded by the state of California. It's a pilot project to support five community colleges in California to create an, an immigration legal training track, two years, um, and then the, the 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 students that are in that track are placed and given stipends to be um, interns in affiliates and and NGOs that uh, provide immigration legal services during that period of time. And by the time they come out, they are ready to apply for a credit representation for a credit to become credit reps if they are hired by a DOJ recognized organization. They intern with DOJ organizations, so it starts from the very beginning. They go to community college. Their, their, their tuition is paid. They are given a stipend. They become interns. And when they come out, they are ready to become accredited reps. So it's a career pathways and it expands immigration legal services. There are other states that have expressed interest in this. And what I understand, and I, I, I didn't think about it at the time, some of it might be a little bit political, meaning is it a Democratic state or a, a Republican state in terms of support? Because the, the budget is a state budget. So I think that's innovative. It's not philanthropy. It's a state. But I'd share that with all of you who live live in states where it might be an interesting possibility. So now I'll ask my 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 folks, let's Rodrigo, do you have some innovative uh, philanthropy sure. secrets to share? <laughs> I mean, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but, uh, you know, the Houston Endowment and Google.org are investing in our universal intake and case referral system that I talked about. Um, again, thinking about the problems that exist structurally, the problems that exist between providers, right? They don't share information. It's hard to hand cases to one another or work with pro bono in many cases in a way that's um, that's safe. So we're trying to promote, uh, you know, through this investment, we're trying to promote collaboration. We're trying to uh, unify systems and make it so that uh, we can all more effectively work together. So, yeah. Thanks, Rodrigo. Can say yeah, something with please. Okay. I'll just share one thing that I've seen that's worked, which is, um, you know, dollars, private dollars being able to kind of catalyze um, an investment um, from the public sector, especially a local and state government. I mean, I've seen that it's the same thing with federal dollars that will, that can incentivize the investment on the local and state level, but essentially like, you know, <clears throat> local and state governments, that initial investment, even if it's like a relatively 
small amount to what we, where we ultimately want to go, it can make a huge difference uh, for local and state officials to make the argument that we don't want to leave money on the table. There's matching funds, even if it's only a nominal amount of matching funds, to be able to persuade their stakeholders to also then make the, the uh, public dollar investment. Thank you, Annie. And Wendy, do you have... Um... Sure. I think, first of all, philanthropy is an incredible partner in all of this. And I, I would echo what Annie's saying in terms of philanthropy and governments working together to advance innovative models to close the legal services gap. Um, and then I will say areas where I think um, philanthropy could invest more. One is in supporting advocacy to bring about mm -hmm. systemic change. Mm -hmm. um, and second is to provide those of us in the NGO community with more general operating uh -huh. support. Uh -huh. So I'll just add this. There's one question, but I think we're going to go to the um, folks uh, here. But there is one question that talks about um, how do we pay our how do we pay our staff more? Right. And that's operating. That's unrestricted funds. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly what we encourage big donors to provide because that will significantly expand immigration legal services when it's confined to programs it restricts us somewhat. Um, so I am going to start on this side with the first question. Could you tell us your name, where you're from, and give us your question? Okay, my name is Andrea Lardia. I'm a parent liaison in Prince William County Schools, Hinton High School. Um, as a parent liaison, the parents usually come to you, come here and talk to you about what is going on, if they have recent arrivals, if they have a deportation order, if they're unaccompanied minors, and they're asking where we can go. Um, we try to do trainings, kindness working in our school, doing, they're going to do trainings for Know Your Right, Catholic Immigration is doing the same. But the problem is in the moment when we need to call for uh, le get legal representation, I sit with the family, so with the student, and I start to make phone calls. But of course, nobody can take the case. And some of the cases are time sensitive. Mm. Like for example, a student who has arrived to the United States when she was 16, um, tried to apply for the special juvenile visa. She was moving from house to house. Finally, was but CPS put her in one, you know, a family member house. She's going to be 18 today. Mm -hmm. She needs, someone needs to go to the juvenile court to present her case, right? Juvenile court say no, because she's going to 18 and things like that, right? Finally, we were able to present everything in court and juvenile court and at least she will be have maybe a chance later to present it um, in immigration court. But all these cases have the same common denominator. They don't have legal representation. So my question is, what about the Department of Justice make an agreement with the school systems where they can do trainings for panel liaisons so school staffs that want to become a fully accredited representative, right, and help the families? They feel comfortable with us. They talk to us about it. I don't mind to help them but I don't work in a nonprofit organization, mm. so I cannot access that. It is any way that we can do that. That's, that's one of the questions. The second question is, can we maybe um, talk more with the courts to understand, like for example, with a special juvenile visa, that they are allowed to present the case, even if they become 18 today, mm. you know, before, before they're 18, they need to present the case. I don't know if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. question. I would just add something about the statute and then Emmett um, would love your thoughts. So the statute, the 18, um, the 18 um, year age limit is statutory. So that's not a court decision. You can't extend that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, let, let me try to address the... About the court, it's, it's something different. In Virginia, they change the law and they say, as soon as you present the case before your 18th birthday, you get under the jurisdiction mm. of the court. Mm. The problem is the courts in Virginia are not allowing if they know that the, the student is going to be 18 next month. Mm. But by law, by the new General Assembly, I think that was passed in July 2021. As soon as they present it before they are 18, they are eligible to be under the jurisdiction of the court for factual findings. 
I can't speak to that particular issue because it's nothing that the Department of Justice, the immigration courts control. With respect, though, to the question of accredited representatives, first of all, thank you for raising the issue and raising the question. I understood the question to pertain to can school staff or school school staff or school employees potentially be coming fully accredited representatives to appear on behalf of children? It's it's a very interesting idea. The 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 regulations that that govern the rules that govern the accreditation program requires that representatives be affiliated, not have to be employed by, but affiliated with, including volunteering at a pro bono organization. I'm not sure this is a fully satisfying answer, but um, there are a lot of, I, I would encourage anybody in that position to reach out to various organizations that, um, nonprofit organizations that, that have accredited representatives and see about working through them. The system, the way the system is set up, that, that, that is just how it functions. But so, and there's, there's nothing that the agency is in a position to do right now to change that. But I also think that it's a very interesting idea and and um you know would encourage that especially obviously people in schools you know speak a lot to 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 students are are, are very much aware of what students are going through with respect to the immigration system so I, th I think it's a very interesting idea thank you Amit. and i think we'll turn to this gentleman here on my left sure thanks a lot good afternoon my name is michael redzik i'm a staff attorney in the immigrant children's program at church world service in lancaster pennsylvania mm. Um, I, I have a question specifically about a universal representation model. I'm also a former public defender. Uh, so I'm a, a statistic I like to share with people right now in the state of Mississippi, there are only 36 full-time public defenders. Mm. You're not, you know, you're well aware. Uh, it's exciting to think about universal representation models, but I wonder if you could speak uh, to the conversations that have happened or whether conversations are happening to make sure that there's a forward-looking formula for funding or for parity, perhaps with OPLA or, or some other office, um, so that that can be something that continues to grow with population and with need. Mm. It's big work. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I hear you. I mean, because what we're trying to do is basically do what Gideon did, right? Like in the criminal legal system. And we want to do that in the immigration system. But we want to learn from the pitfalls, including uh, funding and uh, particularly in places where there is, I mean, there are trends, geographic trends in the country, like the one that you cited of where there's um, underfunded state systems and like particularly lack of capacity and sustainability. And so, you know, that's, a big part of the reason why, you know, we're actually looking at the federal defender model, um, which is, you know, a federal system. And it makes sense because immigration is also ultimately a federal system that can avoid some of those state uh, run kind of um, in the criminal legal system, public defender system concerns. And part of what the Fairness to Freedom Act would do, would do is establish an independent nonprofit and office that um, administers like this new federal system. Right. And including really learning from some of the the key questions about cost and sustainability. So I all I could say is that that's something that we're really thinking about and talking to people about. I would be happy to be in conversation with you and others on that on the policy side and um yeah, that's that's going to be a, a big question when we when this legislation passes and we're implementing this office and the, and the field is implementing the office and a lot of good minds are thinking about it. So please, um, would love to be in touch on it. Thank you. Thank you. And Annie, could you just say what Gideon means? Uh, just the the Gideon versus Wainwright is a Supreme Court case, a decision that established essentially like the the that everybody facing. Um, um, accused of a crime would have access to a counsel in the criminal legal context. And so it, as a shorthand, we just say that, you know, Gideon, we want Gideon in the immigration context as well. And thank you for asking me to clarify that. <laughs> thank you, Annie. Um, and now I'll go to to this person. Um, White, good right? afternoon. My name is Asma Warsi. I am the program director and immigration attorney for Catholic Charities, one of the Catholic Charities affiliates in New Jersey. 
And one of the, and I was in private practice before I joined Catholic Charities, one of the barriers that I'm facing in terms of building my immigration program is we've decided not to do court representation Mm. because Mm. we don't have the capacity Mm. in terms of staff. But the other issue is also we'll frequently see that cases will be rescheduled spur of the moment after spending several hours of attorney time, of client time, preparing for a hearing. And then the day before the the court will just announce that the hearing's canceled and will be rescheduled for another date in a year or two years. The other issue, of course, is that the trial attorneys, and I understand Judge Soper doesn't necessarily have any control over this, <laughs> but that trial attorneys um, <laughs> will terminate cases. And so clients who had viable-ish uh, asylum mm-hmm. claims now have the choice between moving forward and trying to at least argue their case or have some have their claim terminated and then never really be able to resuscitate that. So what I've been seeing both obviously with my own uh, program in the not-for-profit sector as well as private bar is that there are plenty of experienced, dedicated, solo, small firms who still continue to do immigration but don't take court cases anymore. Mm. So universal representation is a great idea, but then we also still have people who are doing the work now who are moving away from it because it's not a viable economic model for the private sector and for the public sector or the not-for-profit sector, we're still running into the same barriers is that we're going to put all these hours into a case, really precious resources, and the clients will walk away with nothing and, you know, obviously feeling like we did something wrong. Mm. So I was wondering if the panel had any thoughts about how to maintain access really not even like expand the the representation but just maintain the representation that's currently in place Mm. so i i'm going to i have one comment and then wendy i was going to ask you Mm -hmm. what you think about it because it makes me think about um so there's been research done on this what what rodrigo described there's one in 1400 representatives in it for uh, 14, imagine this, a line of 1,400 people, low income or poor people in front of you, and you're the one legal representative. That's how I always think about it. Okay, so that's the average across the country. But then in areas where you do have, uh, you know, uh, or, or organizations that can represent, but they can't because of all these, how do we do a mapping of potential pro bono in the corporate letter level? Like, like I feel like heat sensors or something. I mean, I don't know, Wendy, if... You know, if there's a possible mappy, here's all these firms or here's these corporate and this is a council and what do we do? Well, I I, short of putting a GPS on our volunteer lawyers, (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, I do think that that's a a really critical point, Anna, is just pool what we do have. And then again, I think, you know, that some of the procedural challenges that you face are absolutely real. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think. Kind of the, the second half of this has to be focusing on working with EOR, the administration, Congress where mm-hmm. necessary, um, to try and do the procedural reforms to make a system that makes it easy to be a representative of an individual in deportation proceedings, right? Um, we're actually focusing right now on trying to rebuild specialized children's dockets in the immigration mm-hmm. courts and have been in conversation with EOR, DHS, White House about that so that there's actually, you know, a system that's designed to adjudicate children's cases with trained immigration judges, trained trial attorneys, NGOs on site to advise the child as they go into the courtroom. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking creatively about those kind of um, procedural changes that can be made just to make the process easier for the respondent and for the lawyer. Thank you, Wendy. And I guess I just would say this, like when I dream, I dream that we could have a space, a very quiet, confidential space to work with EOIR and attorneys and nonprofits and thinkers on all sides to come together and talk about potential solutions and have, what is it, the Chatham rules, Doris, is that it? We and we go in because we have a lot of ideas and suggestions, and then there's a lot of politics behind it and funding and challenges. But, but you know, we have the minds to do it. And I'm so sorry for your situation. That's a big responsibility. And thank you for your work. So we'll take one more question, and then we have to stop, and we have to get the next panel going. So, sir, thank you, 
Good afternoon. My name is Milsi Polanco. I'm from Florida, and, and I'm super interested in the accredited representative program. Um, I have found challenges myself. I have a nonprofit in, in Florida uh, in regards to uh, obtaining recommendation letters from an attorney. I do understand the stand of point of the conflict of interest, like they are going to provide um, recommendation letters for someone to go and practice uh, while they went to school for a certain amount of years and they they, they, they don't find it fair. That's pretty much the outcome. Oh. And, and and it is it is sad because I'm an attorney in the Dominican Republic and I'm willing to to become first a, a partial and then um, eventually a fully accredited. But those challenges are is the 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 office trying to to work on like to hear a little bit more of those in order to to be able to open the path for people that are really interested in and committed to assist immigration um, um, pe people in need of immigration services taken into consideration that we've been there already and we know better our communities mm -hmm. so why not to open a little bit more for us flexibility probably mm -hmm. um, I I can just address that briefly. Um, I can't speak to the specifics of the the process of the application process. I, I know that there are, you know, there is documentation that is required, but that is that is something that I can take back uh, because I know that we're all in, in, in ta and talk to people who are in charge of that because I know, as I said, we we don't have as many fully accredited representatives as we would like. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is a major issue that we would like to address, and we're always looking for ideas, and it is something that I can take back. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emmett. And then I would just end by saying it's interesting because I feel like there has to be more education around accredited reps, much more, um, because I'm surprised. And and I was this person as well many years ago at how few people know about accredited reps, how few attorneys know about it or, or really understand it and then are somewhat skeptical because they're not lawyers. And again, I was on that journey. Now, after leading this organization, I see the beauty and 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 the strength of accredited reps and they are our backbone and if we are to meet the immigration legal needs of the millions of immigrant men women and children in this country we must use everything we can pro bono IT universal representation and the accredited represent uh, the accredited rep system so i'm going to go back to my office and talk more about like how we educate and how we talk about it and how we must talk about it all the time and then i was thinking um yeah there's there's plenty of work to go around and we need a lot more hands so um i think on that i think we're finishing on time i want to thank wendy emmett Annie and Rodrigo for a fantastic discussion panel work wisdom. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us today. And please take this and share the wisdom and the, and, and the news we shared. Thank you very much.